Okay, good morning everybody, good afternoon or good evening depending on where you are. I believe we're ready to start. Looks like most people who've registered are here. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, welcome to Free Mind Summer School. Uh, today's webinar topic is central nervous system and peripheral nervous system uh, related non-dilutive funding opportunities and we'll be focusing mainly on funding opportunities from the NIH, the National Institute of Health and the various institutes which are funding in this field. We'll also touch briefly on the relevant non-profit organizations and private foundations. My name is Stuart Jacobowitz, and I'm Director of Business Development at the Freemind Group, and I'm delighted to be presenting today's webinar. To learn more about the Freemind Group, you can visit our website, freemindconsultants.com. And to keep up to date on the latest uh, non-dilutive funding, you're cordially invited to follow us on Twitter and YouTube. And you can also join our LinkedIn group, Non-Dilutive Funding for Life Sciences R&D. Today's webinar is the fifth in the Free Mind Group Summer School Series. Uh, we're at mid-season, or you could say this is a halftime show, and I hope you enjoy it. Although there will be no singing and dancing, so don't worry about that. If you missed any of the previous webinars, they're available on, uh, on our YouTube channel, Free Mind Group. Uh, and for your convenience, today's webinar is also being recorded and will be available on YouTube. In addition, I'll also be sending out the slide deck to all of you who've registered for today's webinar. So feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. After today, we have four more webinars scheduled as part of this summer school series. Next week is a webinar on budgets, followed by medical devices. After that, we have SBIR and STTR. And the last in the series will be on registration ins and outs. So make sure to register early. And please feel free to spread the word to anyone who might be interested in these webinars. All of the information in these webinars, as well as how to register, can be found on our website, freemontconsultants.com. At the end of this webinar, we'll have some time for Q&A, where you can enter your questions in the question window on the side of your screen. You're also welcome to call me or email me directly with your questions which are specific to your situation or science. My contact information will be available on the last slide of today's presentation. Okay, so now let's get the show started. So today's webinar, as well as this series, is brought to you by the Freemind Group. And I believe many of you attending the webinar may already know who we are. Maybe you've met us at one of the many conferences we regularly attend around the world, or you've attended one of our non-dilutive funding events, or maybe you heard about us from friends and colleagues. However, for those of you who don't yet know us, let me begin with a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Freemont Group is a consulting firm, actually with a global leader in non-dilutive funding. And our main objective is to help our clients get as much money as possible from non-dilutive sources. We work across the life sciences. Uh, we focus on the NIH, the National Institute of Health, and the DOD, Department of Defense, as well as many other government organizations such as BARDA, CDC, FDA, NSF, and others. We also work with private foundations whenever it's appropriate. We have 40 full-time employees. And we've been helping our clients in their quest for non-dilutive funding for almost 15 years. Freemind files an average of 250 to 300 applications on behalf of our clients every year. And that's a great deal of experience, knowledge, and expertise, which is all put to work for our clients to A, increase their chance of winning an award, and B, to help clients get the largest non-dilutive award possible. Our clients include academics, research institutes, and university medical centers as well as companies from small startups of one or two people to medium-sized companies and all the way up to the large companies, including many of the large pharmaceutical companies. The Fremont Group is basically a tool. It's a tool to help you maximize your non-dilutive funding potential. Now, what does that mean? How do we help you maximize your non-dilutive funding potential? So first of all, our analysts identify the most relevant funding opportunities. This is a very important step. You can have a great science, however, if you apply for a grant that's not relevant to your science or you use the incorrect mechanism, you will not be successful, despite the fact that your science is really deserving of funding. The analysts then create a list of opportunities and together with you, they create a strategy 
a multi-submission granting strategy in order to maximize the application's chance of winning an award. We also manage the complex project's production process. We lead the joint application writing process. It's joint because we can't do this alone. We need you on board in this joint effort because you're the experts in your own science. And when relevant, we support final contract negotiations. Now we're talking about a pocket of money about, of about $50 billion in non-dilutive funds for the life sciences. Now for the purpose of today's webinar, of the 27 institutes of the NIH, the main funders in the field of neurological disorders are the NINDS, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Aging, and the NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. In addition, the FDA and the U.S. Army also fund in this space. Now, CDMRPs are another great source of funding. Now, although this year's deadline's already passed, make sure to look out for the next round of CDMRPs, which are usually announced around March or April. And then there are private foundations. Two of the uh, main foundations in this space, uh, which we'll touch upon a little bit later, uh, are the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. It's interesting to note that out of the $50 billion allocated to funding the life sciences, a major portion of that, around $29 billion, or 60%, comes from the NIH. The NIH budget is currently at around $29 billion a year, and a very large portion of this budget, somewhere around $24 billion, is devoted to extramural research, such as research project grants and R&D contracts. When looking at the neurospace, we see here that a significant amount of the NIH spending is allocated to neurological diseases. Funding for the neurosciences is almost 20%, or around $5.5 billion out of the $29 billion NIH budget. It's important to understand in this graph that these numbers overlap. This graph is not saying that $5.5 billion is allocated to neuroscience and an additional $4 billion is allocated to brain disorders. There is, of course, overlap between neuroscience and brain disorders. So what we clearly see here is that a significant amount of NIH money is directed to the neurological disorder space. And if we drill down and analyze the numbers a little more closely, we can see clearly which of the NIH institutes are funding in the neuroscience space and where they're focusing their funding. The $5.5 billion we just saw, which is allocated in this space, is mostly coming from these four institutes. And they fund a wide range of neurological disorders. NINDS has budgeted almost $1.6 billion for ALS, epilepsy, spinal cord injury, TBI, stroke, and more. National Institute of Mental Health budgeted nearly $1.5 billion towards ADHD, depression, bipolar, autism, PTSD, etc. National Institute of Health, I'm sorry, the National Institute of Aging, which is looking to fund Alzheimer's and dementia, among other disorders, has a budget of nearly $1.2 billion. And the NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, has budgeted more than a billion dollars towards addiction and substance abuse. So $5.5 billion allocated by NIH for neurolog neurological disorders is quite a chunk of change and, in my humble opinion, is worth serious consideration. So let's look at some of the funding opportunities. Now, although we saw there are many institutes involved in funding in this neurospace, today we'll be mainly focusing on the NINDS. The, main, the mission of the NINDS is quite clear and straightforward. It's to reduce the burden of neurological disease. To support this mission, the NINDS conducts, fosters, coordinates, and guides research on the causes, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of neurological disorders and stroke, and it supports basic research in related scientific areas. They do this by providing grants and contracts, as well as conduct conducting intramural and collaborative research. The vision of the NINDS, as you see here, is to enable early routine diagnosis of neurological conditions to develop new therapeutic strategies, to accelerate the process of therapy development, to understand both the healthy nervous system as well as neurological disease, to develop new technologies for observing the nervous system, 
and develop new strategies to probe neural functions, and finally to improve strategies for data collection and analysis. It's worth noting that approximately 90% of the overall budget of the NINDS is used to fund extramural research through a variety of funding mechanisms. And we'll see shortly that there are many interesting opportunities from the NINDS, but let's start by looking at what our analysts see as a new approach, a paradigm shift, if you will, that is happening in the NINDS. Our analysts are constantly reviewing the non-dilutive funding field and are always on the lookout for opportunities, whether due to a change in outlook, focus, or strategy by any and all of the funding agencies. Freemind analysts are also in contact with various program officers in order to keep their finger on the pulse of the non-dilutive landscape. So when reviewing and analyzing this year's funding opportunities and after conversations with various program officers, the analysts at the Freemind Group noticed that unlike in previous years, NINDS is now dividing its funding into three general areas, biological, chemical, pharmaceutical, and medical devices. So what does this mean for those of you looking to get funding from the NINDS? So let's try to dig a little deeper into this NINDS paradigm shift, and let me share with you what our analysts, some of our analysts' insight and what this means for you. So we see here that not only has the NINDS created these three tracks, but they've also developed programs in these three areas. In the biological, as well as in the device track, they've established the CREATE program. CREATE stands for Cooperative Research to Enable and Advance Translational Enterprises. In the chemical and pharmaceutical track, they've created the Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network, or BPN. I guess with names like this, it's no wonder they shortened it to CREATE and BPN. So what does this mean? What is the CREATE and BPN? What do they do? So in the biological track, the CREATE bio is dedicated to biotechnology products and biologics-based therapies. And these broadly include modalities such as peptides, proteins, gene therapies, and cell therapies. This CREATE bio program includes two tracks, the discovery track and the development track, which we'll discuss in more depth in a few minutes. In the chemical pharmaceutical track, the BPN offers neuroscience researchers funding for, dis for drug discovery and development activities that can be conducted in their own laboratories. In addition, it offers the opportunity to collaborate with NIH-funded consultants and CROs. And finally, in the device track, the CREATE device program provides support for projects that focus on preclinical and pilot clinical studies for therapeutic devices. There are three tracks for devices. There's the final design program, the path to 510K program, and the third one is the path to PMA, or pre-market approval, or HDE, humanitarian device exemption. Again, we will get into all of these a little more deeply in a few slides. So this is a general outline of the program. First, I'd like to look at something I think that's very important that, uh, that we noticed uh, that all of these have in common. All three tracks, the biological, chemical, pharmaceutical, and the devices are all being funded using, among other things, but in, in, many of them are, being, are with cooperative agreements or one of the U mechanisms. A cooperative agreement is a support mechanism which is used when there will be substantial federal scientific or programmatic involvement. This is a great way to benefit from the experience and knowledge of the NIH scientists and the program staff who after award will assist, guide, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> coordinate or participate in project activities. All of these U mechanisms are milestone driven and the NINDS staff will be involved in finalizing milestones, monitoring pro progress and decision making. Interestingly, the U mechanisms have been quite successful in winning awards. In 2013, U01s enjoyed a 23.3% success rate. UH2s had a 33.3% success, success rate. And the UH3s had a 100% success rate, although that really doesn't say much because there was only one application submitted and awarded. What do these statistics mean? I'm sure you've heard this from your stockbroker, but it applies here as well. Past results are not indicative of future success. In the end, good science is what wins the awards. Bottom line, 
since it's in everyone's best interest that you that you be successful, the opportunity to benefit from the knowledge and experience of the NIH scientists and staff makes this extremely valuable. And of course, let's not forget there are lots of large awards available, even up to $10 million, as we'll see shortly. There are dozens of wonderful mechanisms in the U series, but the NINDS in these three tracks uses four U mechanisms, which you see here before you. The UH2 Exploratory Development Cooperative Agreement Phase 1, which is used to support the development of new research activities in categorical program areas. With the U2, support is generally restricted in level of support and in time. The UH3, the Exploratory Developmental Cooperative Agreement Phase 2, provides a second phase of the support for innovative exploratory and development research activities initiated under the UH2 mechanism. Usually only UH2 awardees are eligible to apply for UH3 support. However, there are on occasion, on rare occasion times when they make exception. It's also worth noting that the UH2 and UH3 are filed together. It's almost like a fast track, which is why you'll see them together in future slides. They're awarded in stages. So after you win the UH2, you have to reach certain milestones, which will be reviewed. And if they feel you're successful, they'll award you then the UH3. We have also the, UA, the U01 Research Project Cooperative Agreement, which supports a discrete, specified, circumscribed project to be performed by the name investigator or investigators in an area representing his or her specific interest and competencies. And finally, the U44, which is an SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research Cooperative Agreement, Phase 2. This is a, an SBIR Phase 2 or an SBIR Fast Track Award to support in-depth development of R&D ideas which are likely to result in commercial products or services. The scope of all these cooperative agreements is that projects should focus on a single disorder which falls within the NINDS mission. And as you can see here, they all have different budgets and funding periods. The U01 offers a total funding of up to half a million dollars a year for up to four years, an overhead or, excuse me, in total that comes out to about $2.8 million for up to four years. UH2 and UH3, uh, which fund for either up to two years or four and a half years, fund up to $2.8 million and up to $8.4 million respectively. The combined duration of the UH2 and UH3 cannot exceed five years. And the U44, the SBIR Fast Track, where both Phase 1 and Phase 2 grant applications are submitted and reviewed together as one application, provides funding of up to $500,000 for one year in Phase 1, and up to $2 million for up to three years in Phase 2. And just as an aside, we'll be having a webinar dedicated to SBIRs and STTRs in a couple of weeks, so make sure to register. It's going to be legendary. One last point to note is that the next due date for all these mechanisms is October 21st. So it's only a little more than two months away. So this is a perfect time to start working on all the important, all these opportunities. Uh, obviously, whichever is appropriate for you. And after that, you have to wait until February or August for the next deadlines. Okay, so let's start looking at the specific funding opportunities in the three tracks which the NANDS is looking at, and let's start with the biological track. To be sure that you're applying for the correct track, applicants are encouraged to talk to scientific research staff about the stage of their activity and receive advice as to which program is the best fit. You cannot simultaneously submit both a discovery and development track application on the same agent or disease. Under the Create Bio program, the NINDS has two tracks, the discovery track and the development track, development track. The discovery track's purpose is to support the optimization of therapeutic leads, showing convincing proof of concept. At the end of the funding period, projects that successfully advance with support from this program will have identified an, op an optimized candidate, which has sufficient bioactivity, stability, manufacturability, bioavailability, in vivo efficacy and or target engagement, as well as other favorable properties that are consistent 
with a desired clinical application and will be ready for entry into the Create Bio development track. For the Create Bio discovery track, there are two solicitations, as you see here, a U01 cooperative agreement and a U44, the SBIR phase two, a fast track cooperative agreement. The scope of both of these is to focus on a single disorder within the NINDS mission and to focus on the discovery of therapeutic biotechnology products and biologics. Funding for the U01, as we mentioned earlier, is three to four years and up to half a million dollars a year plus indirect costs. And for the U44, which is a phase two or a fast track, up to $500,000 for year one in phase one and up to $2 million for up to three years in phase two. Due dates, next one's coming up soon, October 21st, just a little bit more than two months, followed by February and August. Now, when looking at the development track, it's important to note that applications are not required to have received completed a prior cre Create Biodiscovery Track award to be eligible for the Create Biodevelopment Track. The purpose of the development track is to support IND enabling studies for the candidate and early phase clinical trials. At the end of the funding period, a successful project should have, at a minimum, an IND application submitted to the FDA. The program supports early phase clinical trials, but these are not required components of proposed projects. There are two solicitations for the Create Bio Development Track, a UH2, UH3, the Exploratory Development Cooperative Agreement Phase 1, Phase 2, and a U44, the SBIR Fast Track Cooperative Agreement. The scope of these is the discovery and preclinical testing of novel compounds for the prevention and treatment of nervous system disorders. Projects are funded for up to five years for the combined UH2, UH3 and awarded up to a million dollars for UH2 and up to one and a half million dollars per year for the UH3 plus indirect cost, which could have up to almost ten million dollars. The U44 funding is up to a million dollars for up to two years in phase one and up to one and a half million dollars for up to three years in phase two. Due dates, as you see here, next one, October 21st, followed again by February and August 11th. Moving on to the BPN, the Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network. First of all, notice some of the participating institutes which did not participate in the Create Bio, nor the create devices, solicitations, they join in, in with the NINDS with these BPN solicitations. So joining the game here are the National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute of Drug Abuse, and the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. The scope of the BPN is funding for drug discovery and development activities in their own labs and the opportunity to collaborate with NIH-funded consultants and CROs that specialize in medicinal chemistry, pharmacokinetics, toxicology, formulations development, chemical synthesis, and phase one clinical testing. They're looking for small molecule drug discovery and development for disorders of the nervous system. Projects can enter either at the discovery stage to op optimize well-validated hit compounds to medicinal chemistry, or at the development stage to advance development candidates through IND enabling toxicology studies and phase one clinical testing. Projects that enter the discovery stage and meet their milestones may continue on through development. BPN participants receive intellectual property rights to drug candidates developed develop through this program. The BPN currently solicits two routes for the funding, the U44 and the UH2, UH3. Funding for the U44 SBR Cooperative Fast Track is up to $400,000 for up to one year in Phase 1 and up to $4 million for up to three years in Phase 2. The combined UH2 UH3 are funded for up to five years and $500,000 a year for both the UH2 and UH3 plus overhead costs. Due dates, next one coming up in October, October 21st, followed again by February 11th and August 11th. And finally, the third track in the new NINDS Outlook is the Create Devices Program. This provides support for projects that focus on preclinical and pilot clinical studies for therapeutic devices. 
There are three tracks for devices. The first is the final design program. The goal here is to pursue translational and clinical studies to inform final device design. This supports the development of a device to test scientific hypotheses that are not feasible or practical to conduct in animal models, but are critical to enable next generation devices. Preclinical work should lead to an IDE to support clinical study or non-significant risk study that does not require an IDE. Activities supporting this program include implementation of clinical prototype devices, preclinical safety and efficacy testing, design verifications, validation activities, pursuit of regulatory approval for the clinical study, and a clinical study. Next, in, the, in this devices, we have the Path to 510K program. This program is looking for translational and clinical studies on the Path to 510K. Now, this supports preclinical testing to enable ID submission or institutional review board approval for a non-significant risk study and a subsequent clinical study. It's expected that the immediate next step upon completion of the clinical study will be a 510K or 510K de novo submission or a larger clinical trial which will lead directly to a 510K or 510K de novo submission. Activities supported in this program include implementation of clinical prototype devices, preclinical safety and efficacy testing, design verification and validation activities, pursuit of regulatory approval for the clinical study, as well as a clinical study. And finally, the, the path to PMA or HDE is looking for translational and early feasibility studies on the path to pre-market approval or humanitarian device exemption. This supports applications to pursue preclinical studies for an ID submission with the option of also supporting the early feasibility study. It's expected that the immediate next steps upon completion of the early feasibility study will be a full feasibility study, as well as a pivotal trial in support of the PMA or HDE. Activities supporting this program include implementation of clinical prototype devices, preclinical safety and efficacy testing, design verification and validation activities, pursuit of regulatory approval for the clinical study, and an early feasibility study. As far as funding, the UH2 funding is up to $1 million of direct cost per year for a period of up to three years, and the UH3 is up to $1.5 million of direct cost per year for a period of up to four years. Keep in mind that the total duration of the UH2 UH3 may not exceed five years. And once again, when you add indirect costs, these UH2 UH3s could add, to, add up to almost $10 million in awards. Not bad. The U44 Fast Track Phase 1 offers up to $1 million in total costs per year for a period of up to two years. And the Phase 2 offers up to $1.5 million in total costs per year for a period of up to three years. So altogether, this fast track offers $6.5 million in funding for small businesses. And that's quite a nice opportunity and be a shame to miss. So keep in mind that next due dates for all of these is October 21st, which is a little over two months, and after that, February and August 11th, for the next opportunities. In addition to all the wonderful opportunities available in the cooperative mechanisms, which we just discussed, let's take a look at some of the other mechanisms as well. So let's start with the R01 Research Project Grant. Here we have a funding opportunity announcement for the neurobiology of migraine. In the upper left corner of the slide, you can see the NIH Institute's participating in this solicitation. The scope of this R01 is to perform innovative research to elucidate the mechanisms underlying migraines and explore new therapeutic targets and therapies. Funding here, up to half a million dollars a year, over five years, plus overhead, and has standard due dates, next one, October 5th. That's less than two months away. And the companion funding opportunity, R21, which, as you may know is an exploratory development research grant, early stage proof of concept, high risk, high reward, etc. 
And most of the same institutions participate in this R21 as did in the companion R01. The scope is similar to the R01, which we just looked at. However, as this is an R21, it's looking to fund early stage exploratory proof of concept, high risk, etc. Funding up to $275,000 over two years plus overhead. And with standard due dates, next one coming up October 16th. The next funding opportunity is an R01 for research on autism spectrum disorders. The scope is to support research designed to elucidate etiology, epidemiology, diagnosis, treatment, and optimal means of service delivery in relation to ASD, autism spectrum disorders. Basic clinical and applied studies are encouraged. Funding for this R01 is up to half a million dollars a year over five years, plus overhead and standard due dates with the next one coming up less than two months away, October 5th. And the companion funding opportunity in R21 for research on autism spectrum disorders encourages exploratory and development research, considerable risk, novel techniques, etc. A wide variety of areas of interest are included in this solicitation, so if this is an area relevant to you, I suggest you look at the specific institutes to see in more detail what they're looking to fund. Funding of up to $275,000 over two years plus overhead and next due date coming up October 16th. And finally, we have an R01 for drug discovery for nervous system disorders. Research products for this solicitation may include any activities required to identify, optimize, and validate potential therapeutic candidates and may propose studies focused on all stages of the early drug discovery pipeline from screening to candidate selection. Funding for the selection is up to half a million dollars a year over five years plus overhead and standard due dates apply with the next one October 16th, excuse me, October 5th. And the companion drug discovery for nervous system disorders R21 solicitation, which is again exploratory development research developmental research grant, early stage proof of concept. Scope again similar, not the same, because this is a early stage proof of concept, but it's similar to the R01. And as with all these that I showed you, it's best to look at solicitation for its specific areas of interest. Funding of up to $275,000 over two years, plus overhead, and standard due dates. Next one coming up, October 16th. Now, I wouldn't want to leave out clinical trial funding opportunities, so here we have six solicitations with various mechanisms. There's an SBIR direct to phase two exploratory clinical trial, which is awarding up to one and a half million dollars over two years. There's also a few StrokeNet clinical trials, which are very interesting. For those of you who are not yet familiar with it, StrokeNet was created by the NIH to conduct small and large clinical trials and research studies to advance acute stroke treatment, stroke prevention, and recovery, and rehabilitation following a stroke. This network of 25 regional centers and more than 200 hospitals across the United States is designed to serve as the infrastructure and pipeline for exciting new potential treatments for patients with stroke and those at risk of stroke. So there's a StrokeNet SBIR fast track awarding up to $1.7 million over three years with standard due dates, next one being December 5th. There's a StrokeNet X01 solicitation, which accepts applications throughout the year and reviews applications six times a year. This award is not a cash award, but rather access to NIH research resources, for example, if you need to do uh, high throughput screening assays. It's a great, great solicitation and a cooperative U01 stroke net with an upcoming October 5th due date. There's also a phase three investigator initiated efficacy clinical trial. Now there are not many of these phase three clinical trials around, so this is up your alley. Don't waste time. And finally, Neuronext clinical trial U01. Next application due date is December 2nd, 2014. Neuronext, we just mentioned, if you're not familiar with it yet, is the Network for Excellence in Neuroscience Clinical Trials. It was created to conduct studies of treatments for neurological diseases through partnerships with academia, private foundations, and industry. 
The network is designed to expand the NINDS's capability to test promising new therapies, increase the efficiency of clinical trials before embarking on larger studies, and respond quickly as new opportunities arise to test promising treatments for people with neurological disorders. So as you can see here, there are lots of great opportunities, and these are only some of them, um, but if you're at the clinical trial stage, it's uh, great opportunities out there. Now, after going through all these solicitations, as well as the solicitations from NANDS three-track paradigm shift, if you haven't seen any opportunities that fit your science or your stage, don't worry. No need to give up or despair. A very important part of the NIH solicitation are the omnibus solicitations, also known as parent announcements or investigator initiated. As the name suggests, these are opportunities which are unsolicited by the NIH, but rather you pitch your idea to the NIH. All of these institutions we've discussed today participate in omnibus solicitations. The four parent announcements are, as you see in front of you, there's an R21 for exploratory developmental research where preliminary data, although not required, is very highly recommended. There's an R01 which is funding up, uh, about $500,000 a year for five years. And then there's the SBIR and STTR, both great solicitations if you qualify with the SBA as a small business. Now, all institutes, by the way, participate in SBIR and STTR programs, but we're not going to get into that now because we have a webinar on that coming up September 3rd, so don't miss out. It's very important to note that roughly 70% of all awards across the NIH are unsolicited or investigator-initiated. So if none of the solicitations are exactly what you're looking for, you can always go to the omnibus route, or as I like to say, take a ride on the omnibus. Deadlines for these omnibus solicitations vary. The R21 is October 16th, the R01 October 5th, SBIR STTR is coming up on December 5th. So now's a great time to get working with us or without us in order to meet these deadlines. And let's move on and see what's out there in private foundations. So first of all, we have the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. The scope is of the foundation places strong emphasis on funding translational and clinical research, and it also supports high-risk chiroid discovery work to help keep new ideas flowing into the drug development pipeline. One of their interesting opportunities is their Rapid Response Innovation Award. They've committed $10 million to support multiple awards. Awards here are one-year grants for up to $75,000. They're looking to fund early exploratory, high-risk, high-reward science with little to no preliminary data, but with potential to significantly impact understanding of Parkinson's disease. And they're open to both U.S. as well as non-U.S. entities. Michael J. Fox Foundation also has a therapeutic pipeline program. This program supports Parkinson's disease therapeutic development along the entire preclinical and clinical path. The MJFF is also open to alternative strategies including gene therapy, biological, surgical, and non-invasive non-pharmaceutical approaches that can have significant impact for patients. Here too they've committed $10 million to support multiple awards. There's no set budget limit for these, for these awards and applications are, uh, excuse me, applicants may request up to two years of funding for preclinical development or up to three years of funding for clinical development. If this is relevant to you, you can see the program instructions on their website. And as you can see, the deadlines for, for the spring 2015 review cycle is getting closer every day. So if this fits with your science, now is a great time to start on this opportunity. And the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Their mission is to rapidly accelerate the discovery of drugs to prevent and treat and cure Alzheimer's disease. Today, they've granted more than $65 million to support 450 Alzheimer's drug discovery programs in 18 countries. The ADDF is interested in novel targets and therapeutic approaches for Alzheimer's disease, as well as related dementias and cognitive aging. 
They're looking to fund four different categories of research, drug discovery and preclinical development, early detection, clinical trials, and prevention. And it's important to note they do not fund basic research. So once you've submitted your grant applications, what happens? So let's take a moment to look at the NIH review process, which, by the way, is fairly similar to the review process in the NSF, DOD, and other agencies as well. What they do, basically, when reviewing, considering whether to fund your application, is they weigh the strengths versus the risks. The way they do this is by first looking at two things. They look at your responsiveness and competitiveness. Are you responsive to the solicitation? Because no matter how good your science is, if you are not responsive to the solicitation, you will not be awarded. And are you competitive? When we talk about competitiveness, they basically look at five criteria. And they score you on these five criteria. They score you on the significance of your research to public health. Is it significant? How significant is it? Is it innovative? Are you going to really make a change with your approach? They look at the leadership. Do you have the right leadership in place? Does the PI and the key personnel have the expertise and experience to successfully lead such a project? They check the environment. Can it support the work you propose? For example, do you have the proper lab space for the work you do? But ultimately, what makes the difference between a good application that is not awarded and one that is awarded is your scientific approach. The milestones, the specific goals, Ultimately, top-notch science approach is what wins awards. Now, for a more broad perspective, I'd like to take a step back and give you an idea of our approach to non-dilutive funding and how to maximize your chances for an award. So, first of all, you need to know the interests of the Institute. What's on their agenda? What are they looking to fund? What will not get funded because it's not within their scope, or maybe it was within their scope in previous years but is no longer. If necessary, communicate with the program officers. This is, I can't tell you how important that is. It's extremely important to understand and communicating with the program officers is a great way of understanding better. You also need to focus your project application. Focused applications have a higher chance of being favorably reviewed. Remember, the NIH doesn't fund companies or labs. They fund projects. You don't want your proposal to come across to reviewers as overly ambitious or unrealistic. You also need to make sure to ask for what's necessary. Don't inflate the budget or ask for too little. Having an accurate budget shows you're realistic and you understand your project. And to make sure to present a complete project, have one comprehensive storyline, and leverage on research collaborations. Whether or not the mechanism requires it, or in a case where there's a gap in your capabilities, it's important to collaborate. Take on consultants, statisticians, or outsource work you're less proficient at or don't have the expertise to complete. Now, in an effort to maximize your chance to winning an award and to win the largest award possible, I don't think I can overstate the importance of targeting the right mechanism. As you saw in the various solicitations I showed, there are many solicitations and many different mechanisms. It is very important to know your way around these mechanisms. They represent a lot more than just letters and numbers. They represent the requirements of the solicitation, the nature of the project, budgetary factors, cooperation from the NIH, and much, much more. There are many different pockets of money, and you really need to target what's right for your project. It's also vital to understand the different sides of award and success rates. Know different funding levels and match them to your requirements. And of course, conduct a thorough strategic assessment. What are your objectives? What research do you have and in what stages of development are they? Where would you like your research to be in the next 10, 12 to 24 months? And what's the potential for success for each research project? And all this should be done with the goal of creating a multi-submission granting strategy. The more shots on goal or at bats, your choice, whatever sports metaphor you prefer, the better your chance of success. I'd like to conclude with a little bit about the FreeMind team. We currently have 40 full-time employees, including scientific analysts and grant consultants, who are dedicated to providing clients with the best strategy for targeting non-dilutive funding opportunities, as well as the best execution of these strategies. 
All analysts and managers have a great deal of experience and expertise which is channeled into your application in order that it's the most complete, best written, and highest quality application that can be submitted. And on a personal level, they're all really nice people, which makes working together with them efficient, effective, and enjoyable. To summarize what we do, we offer two core services. First, we conduct a strategic assessment. Our analysts begin by understanding your specific science, where you are now, where you'd like to be in the next 12 to 24 months. Then, based on a series of conference calls, as well as information you send us, our analysts come up with a list of opportunities which is used and created the multi-submission granting strategy. Remember, specific solicitations typically account for only around 30% of awards. The remaining 70% are unsolicited or investigator initiated. In order to properly file for one of these omnibus or unsolicited awards, our analysts engage program officers to get their feedback. We could learn, for example, that AIMS 1, 2, and 3 are very much within scope, whereas AIMS 4 and 5 are not and how it would be best to focus the application. The strategic assessment is an ongoing process taking place year-round. Funding opportunities present themselves literally every day, and when an opportunity emerges that meets your requirements, we will present it to you and see how best to incorporate it into the strategic plan. Once we have this multi-submission granting strategy in place, the grant consultants join the picture in order to work with you and manage the grant writing process. This is a joint effort. We can't do it without you. We manage the process, we create comprehensive templates based on solicitation guidelines, and we fill in as much information as we can, but it's your science and you know it best. This ongoing feedback process, with you answering questions, filling and missing information, and us converging the information in writing and rewriting parts, organizing budgets, etc., is what goes into filing the highest quality application with the best chances of success. And here you see a schematic view of the process and the joint effort. You start with your R&D funding needs, then based on that we create a multi-submission granting strategy, first with a long-term view and then focusing on the short term. We then get into the grant writing and application submission phase, followed by review and hopefully funding. And the process continues for more funding opportunities, more applications, more rewards, and on and on, and happily ever after. So with that, we've come to the end of today's webinar presentation. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it interesting and educational. If you have any questions on this subject, what was discussed today, I'm happy to answer them now, or as much as time allows. And if you have any questions which are more specific about your project or science, I'd be happy to answer them as well. However, please email me your questions or be in touch uh, to arrange a time to speak. And either way, if I don't get to answer your question today, of course, please feel to contact, feel free to contact me. You see here my email address, my phone number, and don't be shy. So I'll take this opportunity to open the floor if there are any questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is Freemind's business model? That's a very good question. Uh, also, thank you. I'm glad you liked the, the webinar. So, our business model is we are success oriented. Uh, which means that uh, upon your successful uh, award, we get usually a 6% uh, of the award. And in addition, uh, for all the work that goes into each application, and a great deal of work does go into it, uh, we also uh, charge a retainer fee. However, that depends uh, based on the pipeline. So um, I'm not going to get into specifics about that, but I'm happy to be in touch with anyone who's interested uh, and we could understand your situation, uh, understand your pipeline, and uh, be happy to uh, answer um, more specifically for your situation. Another question is, are there any limitations for non-US projects? Very good question. So, 
basically, uh, no, there aren't. Most of these are. Uh, you are eligible, whether you're a U.S. or non-U.S. company entity. Uh, the only one with the limitation in general is the SBI or STTR, which is really only for uh, U.S. Um, applicants. Uh, the others, I believe, I, I did not notice any of the others. Usually R01s, R21s in general, uh, as well as the U's are all okay for uh, for international. There, there are occasionally times when um, certain solicitations do exclude. So you have to look at the solicitation, but uh, in general the answer is yes, they are available to, uh, to U.S. as well as non-U.S. entities. Um, okay, I think um, I think I've answered most of the questions. It looks like we've basically run out of time. So um, I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Again, feel free to contact me directly. Uh, you have my email address, Stuart at FreeMindConsultants.com, or my phone number. So in closing, I just want to let you know that we have looked at some of your websites, and some of you have very interesting signs, which we think has great potential. So uh, I look forward to being in touch with uh, some of you in the coming days, and I look forward to speaking to you. Also remember that this webinar will be available on YouTube, and I'll also be sending to all of you who've registered, uh, I'll be sending you the slide deck. And finally, please make sure to register for next week's webinar, which is on details of a detailed budget. I will have the pleasure of hosting it again. So if you enjoyed today's, you're welcome to come back for, for another round. Uh, and even if you didn't, but you're interested in detailed budgets, I suggest you come back for another round as well. So thank you once again, and I wish you all a great day.